Hello, and welcome to another virtual happy hour Hip Historian Tour. We are glad to have you join us this evening. My name is Brenda Holt, and I am the Associate State Director of Community Outreach and Advocacy for the Arizona State Office of AARP. We are the nation's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering people 50 and older to choose how they live as they age. With a nationwide presence of nearly 38 million members across the nation and over 900,000 right here in Arizona, we are working to strengthen communities and we advocate for what matters most to families, such as health security, financial stability, and personal fulfillment. In honor of November being National Caregiver Month, we are focusing on navigating long-term care options. We will also be addressing mental health issues and more. Please visit us at aarp.org backslash caregiving for tips, tools, and other resources. Thank you for joining us again. Please be safe and be well. Take it away, Marshall. Well, hello, good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to Arizona History Happy Hour. I am Marshall Shore, your host for the evening. And have we got a great night for you tonight. So I want to welcome you all. I know we have some people watching on this lovely November 18th. Some of you are watching us on Facebook. Some are on Twitch. Some are even on YouTube where all of these are archived. So you can go back if you've missed an episode and catch up. Or maybe you just want to refresh some of those trivia questions. So you can do that all on YouTube. So today is a special day. There's all kinds of things. Why today here in Arizona, back in 1914, ostrich ranches were so huge, but they were supplying plumes for hats. And suddenly hats with ostrich feathers in them fell out of favor and our farms across Arizona felt that cr fashion crunch. Now it is also Mickey Mouse's birthday back in 1929 was the release of Steamboat Willie, which started the whole Mickey Mouse craze. It is also National Rural Health Day, which focuses our attention on small towns, those rural communities that we have so many of throughout Arizona and how it can be impacted by health, wellness, and that type of thing for their citizens. It is also National Princess Day. So if you have your little crown or tiara, feel free to don it and parade around the house as though you were the princess that we all know that you are. It is also Vichy Soie Day, a day where we celebrate cold soup. Sometimes it can be served hot, but it's basically a potato, leek, and cream. So it's kind of one of those classics, can be served hot or cold. And, you know, it's getting to that weather where I would take mine hot. Now, what can you expect on tonight's Arizona History Happy Hour? Well, we've got a little bit of Arizona music history as well as some trivia. We get to talk about a small town, as well as we have a beverage, because it wouldn't be happy hour without a cocktail. Um, we also have a segment called From the Vault, going and showing things around Arizona that are in unique places you might not expect to find some history. As well as we have our very special guest, who you'll meet in a few minutes. Now, if this is your first time here, you might be wondering, who is that man and why is he on my screen? Well, my name is Marshall Shore. I moved here about almost 22 years ago. 
Um, I was working in Brooklyn. I was at this beautiful Carnegie building, decided to trade that all for a little 1950s library that is now in much more lush digs. Just on the other side of Buckeye. Now, when we got here, we promptly moved into a beautiful 1956 ranch. I'm happy to say it is no longer beige on beige on beige. It is now just seafoam and cantaloupe. And as you can see, there's my kitchen. The house is pretty much a time capsule. The kitchen just kind of is an exemplary example of that. All that buttercream yellow tile, all the original wood cabinets right down to the handles, still working like a charm. Now, when we first moved here 22 years ago, all I can hear about how there was no history here. But I knew that wasn't true because every time I went somewhere, either on foot, on my bike, in a car, I came faced with so many amazing people, places, and stories. And then there's that post-war boom. All those GIs either were stationed here, trained here, and after the war, they were moving here in huge numbers and changed Arizona. So I'm also known as the hip historian, which means I get a play with Arizona history. Why, in fact, we have a our monthly schedule. We have December 18th. We have a haunted history tour coming up of downtown Phoenix. That's always a classic and a lot of fun. As well as coming up on December 11th, we have our continuation of our LGBTQ plus story circle which is just a gathering of folks sharing stories. So that's a lot of fun. We did our one last month. Actually, well, still this month. It's not December yet, so I don't want to get too ahead of myself. So um, as well as I'm so excited because December 14th is not just rooftop bingo, but it is the most spectacular rooftop bingo because it's white elephant bingo. That's right. If you have those gifts that you're not quite sure who gave them to you, so you don't know who to re-gift them to, you can bring them to White Elephant Rooftop Bingo, and those become the prizes. And somebody could win your delightful White Elephant Prize. Or maybe not so delightful as the case may be. And also on December 11th, I am actually working with a theater down in Tempe and we are going to, they are doing Psycho Day, celebrating that by showing the movie Psycho. And so I'm going to be down there and we're going to be talking about some of the history of the Psycho movies, some of the myth, the lore, and the fact that it was filmed. That opening sequence was shot right here in downtown Phoenix, Arizona. Now, I see many of you have found the chat, you know. Also, feel free, if you don't get something in the chat, you can always reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, email, or even through the website. You can track me down. Now, if you are watching on Facebook, I will ask you to click on that little share button so that way all your friends can see how much fun we're having with Arizona history. Because, you know, a lot of people don't think Arizona history is fun. But I beg to differ. Now, we're going to talk about a little town in Arizona. You know, I talk about being from Brooklyn, but I really grew up in Indiana in a small little farm town, about 25 people, two roads, one stop sign. So I have this affinity for that small town living. And so we are going to talk about Chloride, Arizona, which was founded back in 1863 up in Mojave County. It has just under 400 residents. Now, it was first prospected in the 1840s. And the problem was that it didn't become really widespread until in later when there was a signed agreement with the Wallapai Indians for mining on their property. And so it reached as high as 5,000 residents and chloride but by 1944 it was pretty much a ghost town not much left at all now american author louis lamore 
is said to have sold a mine here, as well as he came back at one point in the late 20s. There just happened to be a fire and he got involved in the fire brigade to help keep the town from burning unsuccessfully. And you can go see petroglyphs as well as in 1966, Ray Purcell, who was actually studying um, in Utah, and he took a break and became a miner for a period of time. And so he painted these way back then, and they've held up remarkably well for the age. And so that's always a fun site to go see near chloride. And there is... As you see chloride today, you can go wander through. There's all kinds of little shops. You can go hang out, buy some things. Now, it would not be a happy hour without a cocktail. And so I think I do need to bring on my silent Bob bartender for this because, you know, with PJ, he's always having fun. And so they decided to play up on the fact that, you know, sometimes people would like a bit of maybe a cocktail, but they're in a place where they can't get access to alcohol. So people have to send them alcohol and be creative in how they do it. And so today's cocktail comes to us from a bottle of mouthwash. And what's interesting, it actually had to do quite a bit to make sure that the flavor of the mouthwash didn't hinder this, nor did it affect the smell. So what we have here is, this is called a general order one. So let me dump this in here. And so we have a little bit of Casa Amigo silver tequila, some Damien flower, some dandelion root, mango, honey, and fresh lime. So there we have general order number one. All right. So now... My silent bartender's work is done. So he's going to say goodbye. But I am going to cheers. Indeed, it's not minty at all. That was kind of my fear that it would taste like mouthwash. But you don't even smell it. And so, all right. So, PJ, thank you so much for always turning out an amazing cocktail. All right. And so now we have an extremely special guest. And, you know, and I actually just saw him earlier today. Did a program down in Casa Grande. So let's see. Well, hello, Mike. Hey, how's it going? Good. And yourself? Good. Yeah, thanks for having me tonight. You are welcome. So we've, we're going to have some fun. I know you all have created some trivia questions, but tell folks where you work. They might not know who you are and what a cool little museum you have. Yep. I'm, my name is Michael Sirota, and I'm the director at the Museum of Casa Grande. Um, we have a lot of exhibits there. We have Native American artifacts. We have uh, train stuff, mining, fire trucks. Uh, we have a police exhibit, military exhibit, medical exhibit, um, barn, schoolhouse. It's it's there's a lot to see there. There is indeed. I know that's that schoolhouse has so much history behind it. And so it's a cool thing to see and learn about. So we've got trivia. So normally when we do trivia, it's not your typical bar trivia. We really specialize in trying to make it. It's much more about, you may not know the answer, but it's how you can know the story behind the answer. So unlike in a lot of bars, they just throw out the answer and they're done. Here, we're going to go through and actually explain why is that the answer. Now, you can keep track of your score on your arm with a note, with a marker, a notepad and a pen. You know, it's all good. We are not picky or judgy here at all. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get the ball rolling. So what we'll do is we'll go through all the trivia and then we'll take a little bit of an Arizona music break and then we'll come back and talk about the answers. So our first question, when was Casa Grande founded? 
Was it A, 1879, B, 1887, C, 1902, or D, 1919? And I think people are going to be surprised by the answer when they hear it, but we're going to make them wait for that. Oh, and this is a good one. What electric car company broke ground on a manufacturing plant in Casa Grande back in 2019? Was it A, Waymo? Was it B, Tesla? C, Nikola? Or D, Lucid? So one of those is a car company that broke ground on a manufacturing plant right in Casa Grande just a few years ago. Now here's question three. Where are the Casa Grande ruins? A, Casa Grande, B, Coolidge, C, Eloy, or D, Florence. So the Casa Grande are in one of those locations and only one of them. All right, moving on to question four. When was the Museum of Casa Grande founded? Was it A, 1944, B, 1954, C, 1964, or D, 1974? All right. So the founding of Casa Grande Museum was when? All right. And here we are at that halfway point. What George Clooney Clooney movie was filmed in Casa Grande? Was it A, From Dusk Till Dawn? B, Men Who Stare at Goats? C, Three Kings? Or D, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? So cheers. All right, question six. When was Heritage Hall built? Was it 1898, B, 1912, C, 1927, or D, 1933? Now, some of you might be going, what is Heritage Hall? And you will find out very soon. All right, what pop star was born in Casa Grande? Was it A, Adam Lambert, B, Joe Jonas, C, Harry Styles, or D, Justin Bieber. So one of those pop stars was born in Casa Grande. Who do you think it is? All right, question eight. How many photos are in the Garaya's collection? Is it A, 2,000, B, 5,000? C, 10,000, or D, 20,000? Anyway, that's a lot of photos. All right. Question nine, coming into the finish. What is the shape of the pool of the Francisco Grande Resort? Is it A, a sun? B, a flamingo? C, a suaro? Or D, a bat and ball? What is the shape of the pool at the Francisco Grande Resort. And D, how many signs are in the Casa Grande Neon Sign Park? Is it A, 8, B, 11, C, 14, or D, 16? How many signs are in the Casa Grande Sign Park? All right. Well, while you're all are locking in your final answers, we're going to take a little bit of a music break. But, you know, we're actually going to stay close by because we're going to talk about KCKY in Coolidge, Arizona. So Lee Hazelwood, who is a well-known songwriter, producer, helped create with Dwayne Eddy that kind of that twang heard around the world. They actually met when Lee Hazelwood was working at KCKY and they became good friends. Dwayne Eddy was there. His father was managing a grocery store and they became best buds and went on and changed the face of music. Now, there was also another young man, Jimmy Delbridge, who was working there, who was living there. And so he got kind of involved, 
but then he got a little pulled away by some other things and never went back. Well, actually, he did go back eventually, but he didn't have the biggest career he has hoped. Now, also, what I think is really cool about this little tiny radio station no longer operating in Coolidge, they are defunct, was is that Waylon Jennings also worked there as well. So here you have this little radio station that pretty much single-handedly changed the face of American music in so many ways. And I think it's just really cool that that happened in the little town of Coolidge, not far from Casa Grande. All right, so who's ready for some answers? I know I am. So when was Casa Grande founded? And that was A, 1879. Now, Mike, what was it originally? Was it a farm community? Was it a mining well, community? Yeah, actually, as they built the railroad east from Yuma, um, they stopped because it was so hot. And so uh, it started off being known as Terminus because that was anywhere where the railroad ended. Uh, so a lot of times that's kind of like a fact people have is that the town's original name was Terminus. But then when they say, well, you know, wh when did it get its actual founding? It's 1879. Ah, and I think there was five people was the population. <laughs> okay, so now here's a, so what is the proper way to say the name of the town? I, I've is... heard various things from locals, so I figured I would go right to the source and put you on the spot. That has been somewhat of a long controversy. Um, I know there's a news station in Tucson that comes down every two years or so and they interview people all over town the mayor you know that's a good person to get their input um i have always said uh, well when i speak to people i say both and to be honest i don't know why i just sometimes i say what they say or sometimes i just say you know whatever i don't know but um i would say that the proper way is to say casa grande like to say it with an accent or to say it in the hispanic way because um the person who found the ruins was um, a Spanish speaker. And so if he named it that, it would have had that accent to it. Um, ah, but, good point. Going back to the founder. No, that makes But I know there's sense. a lot of people that have lived their whole lives in town and they say Casa Grande. And if that's how they want to say it, that's I, I'm not in any position to correct anyone. Right. Exactly. You know, it's all about community pride. And so that's the goal. And so... All right. So what electric car company has broken ground on a manufacturing plant right in Casa Grande? Yep, that's Lucid Motors. Uh, it was actually just released Monday, I believe, uh, that the luxury Lucid Air sedan was named the Motor Trend Car of 2022. So uh, I don't know a lot about the lucid cars i haven't you know interacted with one myself but i know a lot of people are very excited for the technology and see it come out and they didn't give you one for the museum not not yet it's not too late <laughs> um and i will say every person that i've asked that question to every person has got it wrong so it's probably surprising to me how many people either haven't heard of lucid or just assume you know because tesla is like the big game in town everyone knows what tesla is so a lot of people assumed it was tesla when i asked him that question just to test it out yeah and now i, th I think now the fact that tesla's got some competition so it should be an interesting thing to see how it all plays out definitely all right so where are i mean you know this is kind of like who's buried in grant's tomb or is it where well, are the casa grande ruins yeah, so this is when we have a lot too. We have people come and they visit the museum and they say, everything was great. We loved it, but where are the ruins? And we say, oh, that's a different place. That's that's a different museum. That's it. <laughs> So the reason it's confusing, and that's a simple question too, to say, I'm here in Casa Grande. Where are the Casa Grande ruins? And we say, they're in Coolidge. And they say, why? And we say, I know it doesn't make sense, but that's just what it is. So the simple answer is that Coolidge was founded in 1925. So at the time... I guess you would say that Casa Grande was considered larger, that it was out to that extent because the city of Casa Grande was named after the ruins. Um, but then later Coolidge was founded and the ruins are now in Coolidge. So 
I mean, kind of is what it is. Can't change it. Indeed. And, you know, and I suggest everyone should go take a look at the ruins because they are pretty spectacular. And it's also, it's a national monument. And not only is the big house a monument, but also the stage structure that covers it. Because it was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. So you kind of get a twofer to be able to see old architecture, indigenous architecture, as well as that modern flair of Frank Lloyd Wright, all in one single space. Absolutely. Oh, you know, and sometimes Pam, who is actually one of the forest rangers over there, is watching. But I guess she's not on tonight. I was like, I was hoping she was going to make a few comments, but nothing so far. All right. So moving on to question four. When was the museum of Casa so, Grande founded? Yeah. So the museum was officially founded in 1964. Um, it was mostly the women from the women's club. Uh, they saw a need for historic preservation and they were interested in forming it into an official museum, uh, namely Flossie Barmus. Um, but they started collecting things and collecting the data with those items and essentially made the museum you know, what it is. When it was founded, it was the Casa Grande Valley Historical Society. Um, we've tried to shorten that up a little so it's a little more memorable. And other than that, um, yeah, we've just continued the same work they started in 1964. All right, so now jumping back for a moment to the last question, Yvonne asked, were the Casa Grande ruins moved to Coolidge? No, no. So, so the, the ruins are still where they were found. It yeah, was just yeah. that then Coolidge was founded around there. And so, okay. Yeah. Very good. All right. So what George Clooney movie was filmed in Casa Grande? Yep. So Three Kings uh, came out in 1998. It was also filmed in California and Mexico. Um, but many people have probably seen this. It also stars Mar Mark Wahlberg in Ice Cube. Um, and it was filmed in the area. I wasn't with the museum at that time, but I talk to people in the community all the time. And they remember seeing celebrities and filming vehicles and things like that. So I think it was a big thing. Were any of them extras? I always love that so many food movies are filmed here and so many friends have been extras in them. Yeah, I haven't talked to anybody that was an extra, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised. I know that's a very common thing, you know. Yeah, they just need bodies to go stand somewhere. And so they recruit folks to just stand there. And so it's kind of a fun way to get involved. Absolutely. All right. So our next question has to do with Heritage Hall. And when was it built? Well, first off, what is Heritage Hall? So Heritage Hall was originally built as the first Presbyterian Church of Casa Grande. Um, it's made out of coarse field stone. Uh, it was the, the stonemason, Michael Sullivan, was the one who put it together. And he made some other famous buildings in town, well-known, historically preserved buildings. Um, but it was originally founded as the First Presbyterian Church. Um, then it was used at, as a mortuary, which is what part of the museum is as well. And then, oh, I never um, realized that. Yeah. And then in 1977, the museum bought it for $125,000. Wow. And it's such a beautiful building inside and out. Yeah. Now we use it as we, we refer to it as heritage hall and we use it for anything you can imagine. We rent it out for weddings. We use it for concerts. We have uh, history lectures in there. We have all sorts of events and things. Indeed. Yeah. No, it's a really cool space. And what pop star was born in Casa Grande? Yep, it's Joe Jonas. Um, we tried to give people a couple hints because the other options, one of them was British and the other guy's Canadian. So for those of you that thought it was Justin Bieber, I'm very sorry. It's not Justin Bieber's not from Arizona at all. Um, but Joe Jonas uh, and actually they came back, as you see in the second photo, they came back in 2010 because there was a wing, a nursery named the Joe Jonas Nursery after him because it's the same hospital he was born in. Ah, so, and, and I threw that in because since it is National Rural Health Day, I was like, 
how cool is that that he came back and they now have the nursery named after him for the fact that he was born there so that's pretty dang cool has he given any money to the museum no but i've I've been interested in reaching out to him and just getting you know kind of like something for the museum you know like a signed photo or you know something that 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 used on so that we can add it to the collection so that you know, I mean, it's still it's still important stuff. Good, good history. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense that he would do that. I mean, if he's willing to help a nursery get a name, he should be able to donate some things for the museum to boost their archives. Ah, uh, and so our next question is one of my favorites. Oh, wait a minute, I lost you. What did I do? Oh, there, I, I clicked on the wrong button and you went away. Oh no, I'm still here. <laughs> All right. So how many photos in the Garaya are in the Garaya's collection? And first off, who was Garaya's? So Jim Garaya's, um, as we know him, he was he was a local photographer, but he took photos all over Phoenix, some in California, um, all over Arizona, really. Um, but he had a photo shop in Casa Grande. Um, and when he passed, his family donated his entire collection of photographs to the museum. We have full size negatives. I, I know you've personally gone through it. You actually probably know more about the Grise collection than I do. Um, you've done a lot of work with it. Uh, but yeah, we have over 20,000 photos. Uh, he, most of his photos, most of his work is between the 40s and the 70s. In the 19, you, you m- might know, but in the 70s, yeah. um, I believe he was working on a truck and crushed his hand. And so he stopped taking photos around that time. Um, but it's a perfect, as, as you often state, it's a perfect snapshot of like mid-century. I mean, he took pictures of buildings. He did a lot of advertising things. So storefronts, construction areas. He just, right. he, not only did he have a wonderful eye, he, he always had the greatest examples. You know, he, his, the people he took photos of, it's like literally a snapshot in time. I mean, they're, they're amazing, the photos he took. Yeah. And so, and I really, I really love these three um, options. So the one that looks like the dirigible or the um, Hindenburg, that was actually an old diner in LA that there's very few photos of it looking like this. And it took us a while to actually figure out where it even was. Um, only because of the post lamp, the, the mm. street lamp. I was like, oh, wait a minute. That's an LA street lamp. Then I was like, oh, well, now we're looking for a diner in L.A. That's a completely different kettle of fish because kept thinking it was Arizona and couldn't figure out where it was. And then, of course, there is the original sign for the Francisco Grande, which we'll talk about more in a little bit. But I sure wish we knew what happened to that sign because it's spectacular. And then he also did a lot of work for customers. And so this would have been this was Funk's Jewelry. This was actually in Phoenix. Mm-hmm. And was added onto a building. They were a pioneer family that did jewelry and got into the fur trade, as well as a little bit of horse, um, actually not horse, dog racing was kind of their shtick. So I love how these three photos, you learn so much about kind of him, the fact that he studied in L.A., as well as then documented some just cool history here in Arizona. Absolutely. And so, yeah, so I need to come back down and spend some more time with some of those images because as I keep thinking about more and more, I'm like, oh, wait a minute, that image I remember seeing, I don't think it's where we thought it was. I think it's now someplace else. So I need to come back and take a look at them again. All right. So what shape is the pool at the Francisco Grande Resort? Yep. It's a ball and bat. And uh, the ball is a hot tub, I believe. And the bat is the swimming pool. Now, why would they do that? Because when it was built, it was built as a spring training resort. Um, They had Pat Boone. He took part in the opening ceremonies. um, And John Wayne had a top floor penthouse that he spent a lot of time there. So it was well loved by sports people as well as celebrities. It was it was a very it was a hit thing when it opened up. Oh, because I think John Wayne had a ranch just down the street over in Stanton. He did. Yeah, he did. Just So, yeah. So he would have spent a lot of time there. I didn't realize he hung out at the Francisco Grande. Yeah, I, would have, which... I think it opened over 60 years ago. Wow. And, you know, it's actually, I would say, probably one of our best examples of just, oh, and of course, I, I didn't, I, I meant to put a photo of the hotel, but I guess I didn't. We got a photo of the menu instead. The fact that it's this brutalist structure, this poured concrete 
that's really quite mod for the time and also the location. And I love that it's you can still stay there. You can still go have lunch and dinner there. Yep, I've it's, been there a couple of times. They have great lunch specials and they it's you have a nice I think it's Duke's. They have a nice steak restaurant and stuff like yeah. that. It's it's a very nice place. I know at some point I want to come down and do an overnight there just so I can get a chance to spend some time with the neon park, which I think is our next question when it's night, when I can actually see the neon lit up. Yeah. So someday I'll be hanging out at the Francisco Grande. Maybe I'll see if I can get the, the Duke's penthouse. All right. So how many signs are in the Casa Grande neon park? There are 14 signs. So, so Casa Grande Neon Park. So why is there a neon park in Casa Grande? Well, um, there, you know, much like the women who founded the museum, there, there was just people noticing that there was a lot of neon signs and there was signage that was kind of falling apart and there was a need for the historic preservation of it. Um, I believe it was Marge Jantz that spearheaded the idea and put a grant together and received funding to build the neon sign park. Um, four of the signs are on permanent loan from the museum. So we had them on display, but not lit or repaired or anything. We just had them as they were donated. Uh, and um, it's lit every night from dusk until 11 PM. So I recommend people. Oh, come I check didn't it out. that late. Oh, that's yeah. a, that's even better. Okay, cool. I mean, and I love the fact that, I mean, it was like, so open, oh, wait a minute, let me change that. So, and I love the fact that the camera is actually from Garaya's Photoshop. That is, yeah, that's Garaya's sign. Because I remember, I remember seeing that actually in the, in the old barn at the okay. museum and then it getting donated now getting to see it all lit up and everything else. Yeah. And then the one with the cactus next to the neon sign, uh, words in uh, that's Arizona Edison. So we had that at the barn for a while. And then the Valley national bank we had in the museum in the barn as well. Yeah. I mean, and that logo is just so iconic across Arizona. They had branches all over the place, not just Phoenix, but in small towns and big towns all across Arizona. And so. All right. So, oh, and I see Jeff is already chiming in because he knows our next question is, how did you do? So I always like to find out how people did and see what were they amazed the most by. So, because, you know, here we're all winners because it's all based on getting to know the stories and getting a chance to explore someplace some people may not have been, getting a chance to go visit Casa Grande. I mean, it's got such an adorable little downtown that I think most people don't even realize what's down there. So getting a chance to stop over, having a spot of lunch or dinner at multiple locations. Because what, what's the restaurant right behind the museum? Is it... Um, Bedillon's Bedoin? Cactus Garden. It's a yeah restaurant in Cactus Garden. That's been there forever. Yeah, it has. Yeah, yeah people should... Uh, you know, come and support local businesses. Definitely come by the museum. We're open noon to four, Wednesday through Saturday. Um, and you can always check our website or our Facebook or anything. We have special events all the time. We have, you know, sometimes we have live music. We have family crafts. We do stuff like that all the time. So sometimes yeah, we have Marshall come and talk for us. Exactly. I mean, I was down there earlier today. We talked about some Arizona music. Got to listen to some music. So that was a lot of fun. And I mean, I love coming down to Casa Grande because it's such a cute little town with such, I mean, there's so much there that people, most people don't realize. I also love Bedoin's because he also has his, his own little kind of collection of stuff that every once in a while he'll open the door and let you go wander through. He does. He, he kind of sneaks you in the back. It's not, it's not like everyone gets in there. You have to be in with him, you know, and then he'll take you back there and show you he's got Old, old Western guns and a Buffalo head and all sorts of old Western stuff. It's very cool. Yeah. So it's just kind of fun to go back and see. And of course, and it's all covered in dust and grime. It's not all pretty like your museum. Well, we, we try. Indeed. And do a great job of it. So okay. Michael, thank you so much. Can I remind people where the museum is and the hours? 
Okay. The museum is at 110 West Florence Boulevard in Casa Grande. Um, you'll know it from the outside. We got the big stone church, the Heritage Hall. You'll see it from the roadside. Um, and like I said, we're open noon to four, Wednesday through Saturday. Indeed. And it's such a fun little town to go visit. And then when you're done there, you can go see Casa Grande ruins over in Coolidge. Absolutely. The Casa Grande ruins are not in Casa Grande. No, they're not. <laughs> no, they're in Coolidge. <laughs> So, Michael, thank you so much for coming on and just enlightening us all a little bit about Casa Grande and that it's well worth a stop between kind of that Phoenix Tucson stopover. Absolutely. I mean, and you know, when at some point, I mean, I, I want to come do the whole like neon trail. I mean, it's like you've got the neon park in Casa Grande and then you've got Ignite Sign Museum as well as the neon Pueblo in tucson so you could spend an entire day and night just playing with signage and neon and kind of central slash southern arizona which i think is pretty dang cool sounds like a good time to me i agree and there might even be some cocktails around in there somewhere yeah sounds good so all right mike thank you so much have a great rest of your night you too thanks for having me All right. So, Michael, thank you so much for coming on and sharing about the museum and some other stuff. And so now you'll see why I said, you know, you should share because you're going to be shocked by some of the stuff. I mean, who knew Joe Jonas was born in Casa Grande and that the Casa Grande ruins are not in Casa Grande, but they're in Coolidge. All right. So here we have From the Vault. So this is a segment that really tries to highlight things kind of around Arizona, sometimes in plain sight, sometimes not in plain sight. And so today we're going to talk about Heritage Square in specifically the Science Center, which is there at Central McDowell. Nope, that's the Art Museum, wrong museum. It's a little further over. Um, but it's full of all kinds of things, but I love that in the lobby, they have a remnant that is part of the first Arizona industrial exhibition, which eventually became the state fair or the county fair. And so it was down over in the, on the salt river near where central is. And so, you know, you've got to think about a time it was. Nobody had cars. Everybody was riding horses and things. And so really, bicycles were just kind of becoming a thing. I mean, and you had the whole issue of what to wear. If you're a woman, did you wear a skirt and ride a bicycle? Because it was not good to wear pants for a woman to ride a bicycle because that was considered not good fashion sense though men could do it. But here you have in the lobby of the Science Center. So this is Lucius Copeland's steam-powered bicycle. Now, he was an engineer at a dairy in downtown Phoenix and had kind of pieces together. And so it is predates gasoline. So you literally would be riding this rather precarious bicycle with a time bomb of condensed steam right between your legs. It's one of the earliest motorcycles. It was said to have gone a whole 12 mile an hour. But one of the caveats is because the roads were so shared with horses and wagons and things like that, that you would easily could fall off. And so I don't know if going 12 mile an hour would have helped or hindered that situation, but just the rise of bicycles led to a whole movement called the good roads movement. And from there, they actually produced a roadmap of Arizona back in, I think it was 1913. And so eventually we know all those good roads that were created for, or kind of put in the place for bicycles were soon taken over by cars. And so there is Lucius Copeland and his team powered bicycle. Now I know for um, Centennial, they actually did a copper chopper. Um, which was really beautiful and really kind of played up on just kind of Lucius Copeland's motorcycle, but it was not steam powered. It was gas powered. 
So next week, well, you know, it's not going to be next Thursday because that's Thanksgiving. So hopefully we'll all be sharing some time with friends, family, or any way that you choose to relax and enjoy your day. Our guest on Wednesday, the day before, will be Randy Walter. Now, he's an author and entrepreneur. And so he is going to talk to us a lot about kind of what he was doing as a business owner and really came famous for offering free hugs. So that's going to be a very special Thanksgiving Day episode. So I look forward to seeing you all on Wednesday at 7 o'clock, not on Thursday, because we'll all be busy stuffing our faces full of something. So, all right. Now, don't forget, you can always throw me a note if you have questions, comments. Maybe you've got a good story that would be good to share. So please share away because I love hearing from you all because, you know, that's really why I even started doing this as just a way to get to know each other and to offer up those stories and to share more and more. So we will see you all here next week. Thank you so much. We'll see you on Wednesday night. Um, I am going to leave you now. We are going to be playing a Dristan commercial because, you know, there are so many snowbirds arriving back in town right now that the weather has gotten cool. I mean, across the state, you'll see trucks and trailers moving around. And so we are going to remind folks that... Sinuses are a thing here. When hay fever pollen invades your sinuses, brings runny nose, watery eyes, take Dristan. Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. Yes, Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. That is, Dristan helps you breathe free and easy, as if you were far away from pollen or allergy irritation. Yes, Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. Helps dry, runny nose, itchy, watery eyes. You see, Dristan tablets shrink swollen, congested nasal and sinus passages which cause runny nose and watery eyes. So you breathe free and easy fast. So when pollen invades your sinuses causing hay fever miseries, don't wish you could be in sunny, dry Arizona. Just remember, Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. Get Dristan decongestant tablets.